It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Acer Predator X32FP. As usual, there is a written review, and that goes into more technical detail, covers some aspects that the video review doesn't, so it's well worth checking that out. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, a nice way of showing your support. As usual, what you see in the video depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on the processing done by YouTube, and very importantly, it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on, so it doesn't accurately represent what the monitor would look like in person. This monitor uses a 32-inch AU Optronics AHVA advanced hyperviewing angle panel, more specifically an AM LED panel because of the use of a 576 dimming zone reactive local dimming solution for the backlight. And it has a 3840 by 2160, that's 4K UHD resolution and support for a 160 hertz refresh rate. So this resolution spread across a 32 inch screen gives a really nice pixel density. It's really good for multitasking. I'm happy to use it without any scaling, but you might want to use some scaling. If you do want to use scaling or you want to use application specific zoom, that's mainly fine because most applications will scale cleanly, which means that you still benefit from the strong pixel density text still has a clear and well-defined look. It really just looks larger, so it's easier to read potentially. And you might find that you want to use scaling, not necessarily because you can't read things, but just because without it, elements do look really quite small and that can be a bit unusual. It can be difficult to get used to. I have managed to get used to it, so I can benefit from the full desktop real estate. But even if you use a bit of scaling, you get lots of desktop real estate, really nice clarity. And that clarity extends to suitably high resolution image content, movies and games as well. And this is all explored a bit more in an article on the website all about the 4K UHD resolution. The article's written from the perspective of a 28 inch screen, but a lot of what I talk about there applies in terms of the clarity to things and the detail levels really. And I do summarize that from the perspective of a 32 inch screen in the written review in the 4K UHD experience section there. We'll of course be showing some gameplay, but this isn't really something you can see from pictures or videos of the monitor. It's really something you'd have to see in person. And eyesight varies, viewing distance varies, expectations vary. So not everyone's going to find this as amazing as other people. But for me, I do notice a significant difference, even when gaming, when I'm comparing this to a 27-inch QHD model. But the difference isn't as dramatic as if you were to compare a 27-inch Full HD model to a 27-inch QHD model. So that's a massive step up, whereas this is just sort of another level, but it isn't as dramatic. It's still something I really appreciate. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So as the usual Predator aesthetic, you have a large coated metal stand that gives good solidity, a nice premium feel to that. It's pretty deep, full measurements given in the feature and aesthetic section of the written review. Matte black bottom bezel with a silver coloured Predator logo in the middle. Top and side bezels are the common dual stage bezel design, which includes a slim panel border flush with the rest of the screen, plus a hard plastic outer part. That panel border blends in pretty seamlessly when the screen is switched off. When it's displaying an image, you can see that panel border as you can see elsewhere in the review. The screen surface is what I classify as a light to very light matte anti-glare screen surface. I have some bright light striking it directly so you can see some of its anti-glare behaviour. It does offer decent glare handling, not as strong as some matte offerings, and that's because it doesn't diffuse the light as strongly. You can get some glassy reflections with bright direct light and in brighter conditions. And some people quite like that look. And because it's not diffusing the glare as heavily, it doesn't tend to wash the image or flood the image quite as much as stronger matte anti-glare screen surfaces. But it still is diffusing light and you can certainly get a bit of washout and hazing in bright enough conditions. It also has positive implications for the image, the fact that it isn't a particularly strong matte anti-glare screen surface, and that's explored in the contrast section. The screen offers good but not full ergonomic flexibility so you can tilt it, you can swivel it left and right, there's height adjustments, exact measurements are given in the written review for these things, but you can't pivot it into portrait. At the rear you can see the solid stand that attaches centrally. If you clip off this little cover there, you can unscrew it and that will reveal 100 by 100 millimeter VESA holes for alternative mounting. You can also see various ventilation slats. The monitor does not include a cooling fan, don't worry about that but it just has passive cooling. 
There's also a little clip-on headphone hook, which is included, this little piece of plastic which clips on. I don't have that to hand, but you can use that if you want to. I know some people care about how solid the screen itself is in terms of its attachment to the stand as well. It's pretty solid. It doesn't wobble very much, even when you tap it fairly roughly. You can see the OSD controls to the left side from the rear. They're explored in the OSD video. There's a Kensington lock slot, a K slot, just there. There are two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, which would face to the left if you're viewing the monitor from the front. And based on the icon there, it looks like the top one's the one you want to be using for charging, or faster charging, perhaps. The remaining ports, they face downwards. You've got a DC power input, so this monitor has an external power brick. As you can see here, it's a rather chunky design. It's around an inch or so tall, or thick, depending on how you want to say it. There's a 3.5mm headphone jack. There's a very generous 4 HDMI 2.1 ports, and they are full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports, so full fat ports, full capabilities with those. You've got DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC. You have a USB-C port, which includes 90 watts of power delivery, DP alt mode, and upstream data. There's a USB-B upstream port, so the monitor does have KVM functionality. It has two upstream ports, and there are two further USB 3.2 Gen 1 downstream ports, so four of those in total. I'd like to say a little bit about the capabilities of the ports as well, but refer to the written review for full information about that. But basically, full capabilities of the monitor, 160 Hz, 3840 by 2160, that's supported via DisplayPort 1.4 and HDMI 2.1. The HDMI 2.1 ports also support HDMI 2.1 VRR. HDMI also lets you use AMD FreeSync Premium Pro if you've got an AMD GPU or compatible system. And with DisplayPort, you get Adaptive Sync, which allows you to use AMD FreeSync Premium Pro or NVIDIA G-Sync compatible mode. You can also use NVIDIA G-Sync compatible via HDMI 2.1 VRR. And as a PS5 user, you can't use Adaptive Sync, but you can use HDMI 2.1 VRR. And the monitor supports HDR at the same time as all of this as well. And last but not least, the monitor has down-firing stereo speakers. So there's one there and one to the right. They support reasonable sound output. I'll say a little bit more about these in the written review. We can use them if you need to. It's kind of useful to have integrated speakers sometimes. Better than some integrated monitor speakers. They're not close to the best I've heard though. So they're sort of mid-range, I guess, in some respects. They're reasonably powerful, decent volume, but they're not really going to keep audio files happy. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to focus on the contrast performance of the monitor. And just before doing that, I did forget to mention when I was talking about the screen size and resolution. The screen size itself, definitely something to consider in terms of it offering a nice immersive experience. For competitive gaming, I appreciate some people sometimes like smaller screens, things are a bit more compact, you don't have to move your eyes as much. Of course, that depends on your viewing position and your viewing distance. I tend to use this monitor quite comfortably from around 70 centimeters or a little bit further back, and I do find it really nice and immersive from this distance. So for that kind of gameplay, I actually really like it. Just thought I'd mention that. But anyway, focusing on contrast, it isn't really the main strength of this monitor. It's an IPS model. Be aware that I have the local dimming solution, which is called adaptive dimming on this monitor, disabled. So I'm just talking about contrast with that disabled at the moment. I'll explore that separately as usual a little bit later. But I measured a static contrast using my test settings of a little bit above 1100 to 1, but you could get a little bit above 1200 to 1 depending on the settings you use. I did have to make some color channel adjustments, which reduces the contrast a bit. Either way though, this is within spec for the panel. So it doesn't give you the same depth or atmosphere, particularly if you're sitting in a darker room as I am now, or dimmer lighting conditions, as a VA model would, and certainly not compared to an OLED. Very, very different look to that. But you have to consider IPS glow as well. That's an important consideration for IPS models. And actually, this model has what I'd classify as a low glow panel, so reduced IPS glow compared to what you'd usually see, particularly for a screen of this size. So it may have an ATW polarizing film, which is used to reduce IPS glow. It isn't eliminated though, so it's not a no glow panel. You can still see some hazing towards the bottom corners of the screen in particular. 
It's just not as bright as it usually would be. It doesn't eat away at the detail levels quite as much as it usually would. It doesn't really extend as far into the screen. But the IPS Glow is kind of colourful. It's quite interesting, actually. And this becomes more noticeable if you view the screen from a slight angle. And I show you that in the viewing angles video. But it has a sort of blue to cyan tint or purple tint, depending on which section of the screen you're looking at and your viewing angles. So it is kind of colourful, but I do find it generally more subdued than usual for IPS Glow. The strength of the IPS panel is the gamma consistency. So aside from the regions affected by IPS Glow, of course that does affect the how you perceive the dark shades, there's actually quite consistent performance compared to what you'd see on VA models. I'm going to kind of stop mentioning TN models because they're irrelevant in this sector. You can't get a comparable TN model to this one anyway. But compared to VA, they have what's commonly called black crush, essentially, where the perceived gamma for dark shades is far too high, or somewhat too high, depending on the model. And towards the edges, it can become too low, and that can actually reveal unintended detail, even if the monitor's perfectly well calibrated to 2.2 gamma centrally. There are these shifts comparing the centre to the edges of the screen on VA models. IPS models like this don't have that issue. When I look at brighter shades, such as the fire here and the little white icon there, I can see a certain graininess to the screen surface. It's not the graininess I've seen. It doesn't have an obvious smeary look in front of the image or an obvious layered appearance either. As I mentioned before, it's what I classify as a light to very light matte anti-glare screen surface. I've already mentioned what that means in terms of the light interaction earlier, but it also means that the light from the monitor isn't diffused as heavily as it is on some matte screen surfaces, so it just helps preserve the clarity and the vibrancy a bit better. I've now brightened the room up a bit. It's still what I'd call controlled lighting conditions. It's just a bit of daylight in the room, but there isn't direct light striking the screen surface. Well, there isn't much direct light striking the screen surface, I should say. But really, you can't notice the IPS glow as readily. The far from incredible depth of the darker shades isn't as apparent, but there is still some glare on the screen. So my recommendation I like to give, if you like to sit in a dimmer room or perhaps in the evening where you want to improve viewing comfort, I would recommend having some lighting behind the monitor. So this could be LED strips, it could just be a lamp or an LED light with changeable colour temperature, perhaps changeable colours if you want to have a bit of ambience. And this can help enhance perceived contrast, act as a bias light, and it can help with your viewing comfort as well if the room is otherwise a bit dimmer. I'm now going to focus on the local dimming solution with the monitor, which is called Adaptive Dimming in the OSD. This allows the monitor to use its 576 dimming zones under SDR or HDR. It's definitely something you want to use under HDR. Whether you want to use it under SDR, it's pretty situational. So I'm on the desktop now. I have the setting disabled. The brightness is set to 36, which is what I use for my test settings. If I change Adaptive Dimming to Low, that activates the setting at the lowest level. So I can now see that the black here is much deeper and there's a bit of brightening up where the brighter shades are, but those brighter shades are certainly dulled down compared to how they were with the setting disabled. And also the medium shades, such as that little tweet button there, they're a bit duller as well. And you can see a bit of halo or blooming around the lighter content with the darker surroundings, but it's pretty well blended overall. It's not obvious on this monitor in general. Also you can see that around the mouse when I move it. The average setting in this particular scenario looks very similar. Fast brightens up things a bit more, but it's still dragging down those brighter and medium bright shades compared to with the setting off. So I've just got it set to average for now whilst I explain how this all works. So when you have a local dimming solution like this, the monitor has to decide whether it's going to dark bias or light bias. Where there are mixtures of brighter and darker shade occupying a particular zone, it can either brighten that zone up so that the bright content's nice and bright, or it can dim that zone down so that the dark content is shown appropriately. And this monitor tends to very heavily dark bias, so it will tend to drag brighter shades down and medium shades down so that they're darker to try and keep things looking sort of deep and atmospheric. You can offset this dark biasing to a degree by increasing the brightness. So to give you an extreme example, I've just increased the brightness to 100, 
And now the text there looks more like it did using my test settings, but remember that was a brightness of 38, and with the adaptive dimming enabled, I'm using a brightness of 100. The bright shade for that image surrounding the monitor there and, and there, very bright indeed. You can see overexposure on the video. It doesn't look like that to the eye, so I've adjusted the exposure a bit. But anyway, if I then look at brighter content, so using my Twitter example, I'm just going to set it to default. That is very bright indeed, uncomfortably bright for regular usage for me. So I would not use the brightness anywhere near 100 with this setting on the desktop, if I did like using it on the desktop, which I don't. A strange inconsistency. So if I select dim, which will give a dark gray shade in the background, it basically looks like there's just really bad uniformity on the screen. I'm gonna increase the exposure so you can see this more clearly. You can see that around the brighter content, the grays lightened up quite a bit, whereas it's darker further out. You'll also notice that there's a halo around the mouse. So these kind of inconsistencies, they're really easy to notice on the desktop. You tend to have large areas of individual flat shade, and you have straight edges, just lots of contrasting shades, and it makes these inconsistencies and the discrepancy between the number of dimming zones and the pixels of the screen very obvious. And yes, I do observe all of this if I significantly lower the brightness as well. If you set adaptive dimming to low, that's a gentler approach to the dimming. So there is a bit of a halo around the mouse, but to the eye, it's not obvious. The background still looks ununiform, although not as bad as it appears on the video, I have to say. So some may prefer the low setting on the desktop, but I don't know if you can see the halo actually lags behind the mouse cursor as I move it with this setting, whereas with average or fast, the dimming zones are very responsive. They react extremely quickly to changes in the scene. But in summary, don't like this setting on the desktop, but I don't generally like local dimming settings on the desktop anyway. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I've got adaptive dimming disabled just at the moment using my test settings. I'm just gonna switch it onto fast because it's easier to show you the differences and flick between off and fast just for the video. So yes, the camera does compensate, but to my eye, things are much deeper for these dark to medium shades with adaptive dimming enabled, whereas the bright shades maintain nice brightness down here. Having said that, things aren't as spectacular as they are under HDR. Now, of course, I could increase the brightness. But the monitor simply doesn't have as much data to work with as it does under HDR. You don't have the same tone mapping precision and luminance precision. So the lava here, it should have well-defined bright areas, and that will include bright whites, bright yellows, and there should be a really nice array of shade brightnesses for oranges and reds flowing around. Whereas with this local dimming setting, it depends on the brightness you set. The bright areas can look pretty bright as they do right now, but not as bright as they would under HDR. But there just isn't the same variety, and things just look flatter in general. With the brightness set this high, the medium to bright shades here are flooded, they're too bright, doesn't look atmospheric. I know I like to use that word a lot, but basically it just doesn't look as it should. So I prefer using a lower brightness, this is my preference. You might like to use a higher brightness if you want things to look more dynamic, as I was showing you just before, but remember that it does drag those shades up. You kind of have the opposite problem when you reduce the brightness. Shades can be dragged down too much, a bit dull. So some of these medium bright shades, like the gold there, just looks duller than it should. And now if I disable local dimming, or adaptive dimming, sorry, it actually brightens things up, lifts things up. So some shades are more appropriate with the adaptive dimming enabled, but others are dragged down too much, and that's because of that strong dark biasing. Remember that if it was bright biasing more, then it's going to be eating away at the atmosphere and the depth of darker shades. I'm not saying that they've tuned things perfectly algorithmically, and I will talk about this more with respect to HDR a bit later in the video. I'm on another scene on Shadow of the Tomb Raider now. I have adaptive dimming disabled just at the moment, and to my eye, things look a lot less atmospheric. Sorry to use that word again. A lot more flooded. Clearly, a lot of shades much brighter than they should be. And that's even just with my test setting brightness, so I haven't ramped up the brightness or anything at the moment. If I enable the adaptive dimming setting... So yeah, I'm just using fast just for the moment, as it's easier to enable and disable. There's much better depth to a lot of shades. Things look just more solid, more of an inky look. If you're interested in the numbers, by the way, in terms of what this can do for your contrast, do check out the written review 
the contrast and brightness section, the table there, makes a significant difference to your contrast having this enabled. However, things aren't perfect. I look at these brighter elements like the lights there. They're also dimmed because of the dark biasing. So with it set to off, extra brightness. Back to fast, of course, you could increase the brightness levels, but that again gives too much of an uplift to the medium bright shades. And this is actually a problem I have with the high brightness with SDR local dimming in general. And it's particularly obvious in some daylight scenes Really, you just get an overwhelming level of brightness because unlike under HDR, you don't just have little bright highlights and a much better variety of shades with careful tone mapping. You just get this huge, pretty much universal uplift if you increase the brightness with local dimming enabled. So it doesn't give you an HDR-like experience at all. And that's again why I like to lower the brightness. Another issue, I'm just going to keep it to 100 for now because when I talk about these issues I'm about to talk about, it makes them more obvious on the video. There's also a flickering effect, and that's because of the little halos like I showed you on the desktop with the medium shade in the background with the small bright shades there. The zones are readily transitioning between the two states. It's more obvious with the lights up here, actually, with the dark sky in the background. And also the embers there against the sky and the fireworks now. You can see halos moving all around. Lower the setting to average. This isn't as obvious. It's still there, and it is exaggerated a bit in the video, by the way, now, but it doesn't catch my eye so much. So for this reason, I actually prefer to use average over fast. And it's not just this scene. This is quite a torture test for local dimming solutions like this. But there are just some scenes where I do find that there are some distractions using the fast setting, which are less obvious using the average setting. You can use the low setting if you want to pretty much eliminate this. So now there aren't those little dancing halos and flickering, anything like that. But if you remember when I was showing you on the desktop there's more of a delay to the dimming transitions using the low setting. It's not exactly like you've got slower response times, it's sort of separate, but it does give an additional element to perceived blur or an additional perceived delay, particularly for fast moving scenes. And I don't like this very much. I do notice it in places. And I just prefer the balance with average. I feel that the low setting is just too unreactive. So again, my preference is average with reduced brightness. I'm on another scene on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I have adaptive dimming disabled. This is the scene I showed you with contrast. The camera's set up a little bit differently to try and highlight some of the differences a bit better. But here you can again see a bit of a bit of IPS glow, the kind of things I discussed in the contrast section, and the overall depth to the dark shades there, not particularly impressive, and that's putting it quite mildly. With adaptive dimming enabled, the atmosphere is much better, the depth to those dark shades is much better. I'm just going to keep it on my preferred average setting. So that eliminates the IPS glow. There's really nothing to speak of now visible. There are actually some subtle details here, so it's not just showing pure black. They actually have some little bones, some little skull details. Because of the heavy dark biasing, they are dimmer and more masked than they ideally would be. And just as a general point as well, if you're using this monitor for competitive gaming, you might not want to use adaptive dimming for this reason, because it can sort of give a bit of a muddy look to some shades, drag them down, and that can mean that enemies are less visible than they should be, for example, against certain backgrounds and in certain environments. So you don't really want that kind of thing for competitive gaming, but for, for more casual play, I do think the overall contrast enhancement with local dimming active can be really nice. And if you're a numbers person and you prefer to look at that side of things, definitely check out the contrast and brightness section of the written review, the table there, which shows what the monitor is capable of in that respect. So speaking of the heavy dark biasing, the medium bright shades in the middle there, they are dulled down quite a lot. On the plus side with that dark biasing, the dark shades nice and deep and atmospheric, not to the extreme that you'd see under HDR by the way. And also if you increase the brightness, then it unmasks some of that detail, not shown very well in the video, but the little bones are more visible now but 
The depth of the dark shades is dragged up quite a bit there as well. Things look less flooded than they did with the setting disabled, but more flooded than with a lower brightness. Under HDR, on the other hand, with the precise tone mapping and luminance precision, it maintains exceptional depth. So I'll come on to that later when I look at HDR. But either way, having adaptive dimming enabled under SDR gives a really nice edge in overall depth and atmosphere compared to having the setting disabled. So with my brightness ramped up completely to 100 now as well, yes, the brighter shades are a bit brighter, but they still look a touch dim in places, to be honest. But on some models with local dimming, I would mention halos here with the HUD elements there. There's a little bit of that going on. Remember, I've got the brightness set to 100, but even then, it's actually dark biasing so strongly that the white there is dragged down enough to really avoid obvious halos. But no matter what you have your brightness set to, some of these bright shades are going to be brighter than with local dimming disabled and the same brightness setting used. So it certainly does give a more dynamic experience. If I now go to a bright daylight scene with the brightness set to 100, then I'm probably going to find the brightness overwhelming and uncomfortable in a way that I don't find bursts of brightness under HDR uncomfortable. So I've just reduced it again to my test settings brightness because that's my preference. Everyone's going to have their own preferences when it comes to brightness levels with adaptive dimming enabled. I would recommend trying a similar setting first off to what you're using with the setting disabled. Then increase the brightness a bit. If you find it comfortable, even in bright scenes, then that's good. You can use that and you might enjoy the more dynamic look to things with the higher brightness levels. But generally for games and video content that support HDR, you're probably going to want to be using that. And I'll be going through all the nice benefits of HDR shortly. But outside of that, for titles that don't have a good HDR implementation or perhaps don't have an HDR implementation, the SDR local dimming is a nice fallback. I'm now on legom.nl, the website and the test for viewing angles. This isn't represented very well, I have to say, in the video. The camera doesn't capture this properly. It looks like this has a quite strong vignetting effect. There is a little bit of that on this monitor, and I'll come on to that with the solid shades. But when I observe this background to the eye, it's not anywhere near as strong as it looks on the camera preview screen. So I'm going to assume that it's like that in the video as well. So don't pay too much attention to that. But the representation of the text is kind of interesting as well. It should ideally look a blended grey throughout the screen. On this monitor though, it sort of transitions. It looks a blended dark red for the most part, but then it goes sort of green to cyan towards the top left corner of the screen. I observe this as well if I keep my eyes central but move further back. So this indicates there's actually a bit of a uniformity issue on my monitor. And the colours as well, they're exaggerated because of the particularly wide gamut on this monitor. So these two combined seem to give sort of some strange colours which you wouldn't usually see. Either way though, I don't see flashes of obvious saturated red and strong saturated green and shifts between these and saturated orange as I shift my head a bit. And that is indicative of a relatively strong viewing angle performance and a relatively weak viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor, which is what you want to see, and that's typical for an IPS model. Again, not represented well on the camera, I'm afraid, but to my eye, this looks like a pinkish purple throughout the screen. It looks slightly brighter, slightly brighter pink towards the extreme edges of the screen, but that's quite common with models that have a dual stage bezel design because there's a little bit of pressure in that region and this dual stage bezel design is extremely common. The red block that looks a rich and vivid red throughout the screen, a little bit duller towards the edges of the screen, and that's not just because of a sort of pinching from the bezels. This is actually a viewing angle related issue. A little bit of vignetting is actually noticed on this particular shade. So it's most pronounced towards the corners, but it's not extreme. It, it is something which the strongest IPS models and certainly OLED monitors wouldn't show. And it's something which is stronger if you sit closer to the monitor, less pronounced if you sit further from the monitor. As long as you're keeping your eyes quite central to the screen, or, you know, reasonably central, you're not viewing it from an extreme angle, anything like that. But this kind of shift is way less pronounced than the shifts you'd see for this kind of shade on VA models, where you would have significant shifts in saturation comparing the centre to the edges of the screen. The green block appears a saturated green chartreuse shade throughout, and I apologise if the camera's pulsing a bit, the autofocus is going a bit crazy. But yes, saturated green chartreuse throughout, a little bit brighter towards the extreme edges of the screen, just a little bit, nothing particularly bothersome. The blue block, as usual, nice rich royal blue throughout the screen. 
I'm now on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. This monitor has a very generous colour gamut and you have to remember that content like this, most content you consume whether it's on the desktop, you're watching movies or you're playing games in SDR, it's designed with the sRGB colour space in mind. If you're using a gamut on the monitor that's wider than that, then you get extra saturation and extra vibrancy. I'll just show you the gamut on the screen now to help set the scene. So it's got 96% DCI-P3 coverage, but that massively undersells the gamut. As you can see, it extends significantly beyond DCI-P3, particularly in the green to blue region, which also includes your cyans. And for those interested, I measured 100% Adobe RGB coverage and also some extension beyond that. Of course, if you have this much DCI-P3 coverage, you would naturally have extension beyond Adobe RGB. But you can see that comparison in the written review at the start of the color reproduction section, if you're interested. So what this means is that there's significant amount of extra saturation and vibrancy. Some people will really like this look actually. So the blue of that crate there, the light blue, has incredible pop to it, really eye-catching. The sky blue as well, very eye-catching. I'd say almost a kind of cartoonish look, sort of really too much saturation for the sky blue. And the red paint there on these, extremely eye-catching. Even the yellow ladder is quite eye-catching. So really you know, just these shades, oh yes, the, the greens of course, how could I not mention them, very eye-catching as well. And they are brought out too strongly, these greens as well. That bush, for example, really far more eye-catching than it should be. But there is still a nice variety of shades, it's not the same as when you digitally enhance the saturation where you're not expanding the gamut, you're just pulling shades closer to the edge of the gamut, because that crushes your shade variety. Although things are oversaturated because of the wide gamut here, you do still get the variety. Like I said, some people will like this look, but it's not for everyone. And there aren't really any particularly good examples of this in this scene, but when you look at skin tones and patches of earth, you can sometimes see a bit of a red push to them as well because of the very generous extension in the red region of the gamut. So slightly reddish browns become very reddish browns and pinks converge on red as well, a bit too much. So it's just something to be aware of. If you don't want any of this, you don't like this kind of look, then you can change color space to sRGB instead of standard. That tones things down suitably. On my unit, the sRGB emulation setting was actually quite well calibrated. So it does clamp well to the sRGB color space with really very little overextension and just a little bit of under coverage. The white point on my unit was reasonably well calibrated. Things were a little bit warm and slightly green tinted. Not an extreme thing, not something which visually you might really sort of feel disgusted by or anything like that. My colour emitter was still quite happy with the colour accuracy. You can see this in the calibration section of the written review if you're interested in that side of things. Thankfully you can adjust the brightness but you can't adjust contrast, not that you necessarily want to. 50 is actually optimal on this monitor anyway. You can't adjust the black boost don't have access to low blue light, and you can't adjust the gamma, and you can't adjust the colour channels. There's also a DCI mode which clamps to the DCI-P3 gamut without extending beyond that very much at all. So you set the colour space to DCI, but this also targets a very high gamma. I actually measured 2.7 on my unit. 2.6 is the standard gamma for work within the DCI-P3 colour space, but not everyone likes to use that. Just be aware though that you can't change that in the OSD because the gamma setting is locked. And my unit, it also had a rather strong green tint, also a bit warm, but this was more extreme than with the sRGB setting. So it isn't necessarily something that people are gonna use, but it's just another option. And you might happen to kind of like how things look. Remember that you also have six axis saturation control on this monitor if you're not using the sRGB setting. So if you just find some shades a little bit too intense, you could actually tone them down a bit but it's hard to get the balance right by doing that. And I do cover this in the OSD video, by the way, the saturation control. It's just that you find that some shades will start to look rather undersaturated, while some are still a bit oversaturated, even if you're just considering red bias shades and you're just reducing the red saturation. So just something to keep in mind, but subjectively you might be able to get a nice balance by doing this. So it is good that you have that kind of flexibility on this monitor. So just return to my test settings using the full native gamut. In the video this might actually look less saturated than the DCI setting, but that's because the brightness was set very high and like I mentioned the gamma was very high as well with the DCI setting and you just can't see what you'd see to the eye anyway. So 
don't worry too much about that particular visual comparison. But anyway, this very generous gamut is certainly useful for content creators. So if you want to use this for work, you're using the monitor for color accurate purposes. Really nice Adobe RGB coverage. You get good DCI P3 coverage and of course full sRGB coverage as well. Ideally, you would profile the monitor with your own colorimeter or similar device. There are some ICC profiles in the calibration section of the written review you can try as well, which will have gamut mapping. But again, it's always best if you use your own colorimeter or similar device to calibrate the screen for the highest levels of accuracy. And just a final thing to note as well, as I mentioned with the GOM, good color consistency overall. And that means that the saturation levels that I'm talking about, they're maintained very well throughout the screen. You don't get that kind of loss of saturation peripherally like you'd get on VA models. So with the strong vibrant look you can get, particularly with the native gamut here and the strong color consistency, it really is a highly vibrant look. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about the HDR performance of the monitor. This monitor is Visa Display HDR 1000 certified, which is one of the higher levels that Visa will certify for on LCDs. So its so-called AMLED panel has 576 dimming zones, and these are very reactive dimming zones. That is to say that they react very quickly to changes between light and dark, certainly if you're using the average or fast adaptive dimming setting. And I will remind you about that shortly. I know I covered it in SDR Local Dimming, but it's worth going through it again. Now I've got HDR active. I'm using an NVIDIA RTX 3090. I tested with HDMI 2.1. I'm using DisplayPort 1.4 at the moment. Very similar experience with both. I also tested with an AMD RX 580. And if I had AMD FreeSync Premium Pro disabled in the OSD, meaning I wasn't using Adaptive Sync or I wasn't trying to use any sort of VRR on the AMD GPU, it looked very similar to what I'm seeing and talking about with NVIDIA. However, if I had AMD FreeSync Premium Pro active, it uses an alternative HDR pipeline. It's still HDR10, but the tone mapping's different and basically it just messed everything up. It looked really washed out, completely flooded. It didn't look like it should. And I don't know how much of that is down to the FreeSync Premium Pro pipeline and how much is down to the fact that, that is an old GPU, the RX 580. It doesn't even support DSC, although it didn't matter if this was enabled or disabled in the OSD, the DSC setting. It didn't matter if I was using HDMI or DisplayPort, and I tried various different refresh rates as well. And the same thing happened, so quite curious. So the usual HDR10 benefits apply. That includes 10-bit color processing, which is where HDR10 gets its name from, enhances the nuanced shade variety. So there is a greater variety of closely matching dark shades, and this gives a natural uplift to shadow detail. And it also allows the monitor to put its color gamut to potentially good use. It also allows a superior variety of closely matching bright shades, so you get smoother gradients more natural looking weather effects, particle effects, that kind of thing. But before going any further, I think it's time to throw in some figures and talk about the brightness capability of the monitor under HDR. So this looks a bit busy, I appreciate that. And if you are colorblind, I apologize in advance, this will look just very confusing. But the three lines that are clustered together, they are this monitor running different local dimming settings, low, average, and fast. So low is navy blue, Average is purple and fast is green. And these three lines end up as the highest value recorded on this chart. The other lines is a light blue line, which shows the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 using its high local dimming setting. And the orange line shows the Dell Alienware AW3423DW using its peak HDR 1000 setting. And this is similar to other QD OLED ultra wides. What you can see if you focus on the X32 FP's lines for the low average and fast, there aren't really dramatic differences recorded here between the different settings. The biggest differences occur at 25%. And by the way, the percentage at the bottom, that refers to the white patch size. So if you're not familiar, this test works by having a white rectangle in the middle of the screen, which is pure white under HDR and it's surrounded by pure black. And that rectangle is various different sizes, so it covers 1%, 4%, 9%, 25%, 49%, or 100% of the pixels. So when it's 100% of the pixels, the entire screen's white, there's no black. And also the 100% readings here are actually sustained readings. So these are taken after 30 seconds, rather than just being peak readings. 
Although with this monitor, there wasn't a huge amount of difference either way, whether they were peak or sustained. But you have to remember that actual content will have a mixture of shades, various different depths, and there are other differences, as I pointed out in the local dimming section between the low average and fast settings. You'll see with this graph that the monitor gets progressively brighter as more white is displayed on the screen. Or if you're thinking of real world content as more bright shade is displayed on the screen. The reason for that is that the monitor's local dimming algorithm dark biases very strongly. So that means that when there is a mixture of dark and light covering a dimming zone, it has to make a compromise one way or the other. It can brighten up the zone a lot, but that will compromise the depth of the darker shade, or it can dim the zone a lot, which will help with the depth and the atmosphere. But at the same time, it starts dragging down the brighter shades and it can also drag down medium shades. Again, I explored this in the SDR local dimming section and I will explore it more a little bit later on in this section. But as bright shades dominate, you can actually see an advantage to the X32 FP compared to the other monitors. The reason the QD OLED dims is because it has AVL, automatic brightness limiter. There are power limitations. It draws more power as more pixels become very bright. So it just dims the screen where bright shades dominate. The Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 and the G8 for that matter, they have a similar thing actually. They have power limitations, which is actually a bit odd to see on a mini LED monitor. But you can see that the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 peaks at 1,356 nits. That's what I recorded, very impressive indeed, at a 4% window. But at 25%, it's pretty similar to the Acer. And beyond that, the Acer has a clear edge. So what does this all mean in practice? Back to some gaming. Here there are a mixture of medium and darker shades. And even here, I can notice the dark biasing. So some of these medium shades are dragged down. They look a bit duller than they should. But the depth of the very dark regions is quite impressive. And the dark biasing also drags down my crosshair so it doesn't create an obvious halo around it where there's dark shades. There is a halo. So for the dimming zone that the crosshair occupies, that is brighter than the dimming zones showing the black cracks in the rock or the shadow detail elsewhere. The same with the HUD element. That might be a bit clearer on the video, actually. You can see a halo around it, but it's not as bright as that halo could be if the monitor was bright biasing more and therefore made those bright shades brighter. But the scene definitely isn't as impressive as it would be on an OLED where you have per pixel illumination. On the Acer, you've only got 576 dimming zones spread across a 32 inch screen. That is a relatively small number. With an OLED monitor, you've got millions of dimming zones. So it is able to make those darker shadow details exceptionally deep and dark. There's no haloing. It can make the medium shades the appropriate depth as well. So everything just stands out better on the OLEDs. But if I compare what the monitor here is showing to what most LCDs show without FALD, full array local dimming or mini LED solution, then the Acer is definitely a lot more impressive than that. But the, the bright content there is nice and bright in comparison. It can show that brightness at the same time as nice depth for the darker shades. It isn't super bright, this bright area, because the sun isn't streaming in. It's not actively illuminated in that way, so to speak. So the monitor is not even trying to pump out its maximum luminance, and it's not. It's sort of around 400 nits or so, although it varies depending on where you're looking at it from. But I'm just going to dive into the water and I will show you some other scenes for a bit of variety and I'll also show you a little bit of Battlefield 5 for more variety. But I do like this scene here for testing out monitors in HDR and actually Tomb Raider in general is a, it's a good game. It has a good HDR implementation which is able to really test the HDR hardware in the monitors. That glint on the water is nice and bright. I measured just shy of 700 nits, so there is actually still some dark biasing. The monitor's not just going crazy and if you think about it, this particular glint isn't exactly filling up a huge amount of the screen and it's surrounded by somewhat dimmer shades, sort of medium shades. So the monitor does have to dark bias here, so it's not put to its full potential for this glint, but it's still nice and bright, nice and eye-catching. The darker shades there have good depth to them, but again the dark biasing kind of muddies things a little bit or, or makes them a bit duller than they'd ideally be. There should be a little bit of extra brightness here. It's not too bad in this scene, to be honest. And again, I'd just like to stress that the overall look is vastly better than most LCDs under HDR. And the 10-bit colour reproduction really helps the nuanced shade variety, as I mentioned just before. 
that doesn't just look like a giant ball of light it's just quite bright which is why it looks like a giant ball of light on the camera but you can actually see nice smooth gradients for the mist around the waterfall and the rays of light and just because you're running HDR it doesn't mean that all gradients are going to be nice and smooth it is up to the game developer to actually implement it properly so some games show this better than others and some elements and games show it better than others as well I'm on another scene and the glint on the surface there is pretty bright. I wasn't actually able to measure this because it's too much of a small bright area to properly cover the colorimeter sensor area so you can't get an accurate reading of this and it's shimmering a lot, it's moving a lot. But this scene is quite a bit more impressive actually on the QD OLED monitor, the AW3423DW, which is a monitor I use for my own enjoyment actually for gaming quite a lot and I use it as a reference monitor so I like to compare other monitors to it. It's still nice and bright and the surroundings are relatively dark, however it has a little bit of a slightly foggy look here and that's because it's not just trying to show pure black, it's a mixture of medium and dark shades. So the shadow detail isn't anywhere near as deep as it is on the OLED, it just doesn't have that level of precision. But the local dimming certainly does its thing. In fact I'm just going to disable adaptive dimming just to really reinforce this point. So now it's completely flooded, it looks absolutely terrible, the whole scene just doesn't look like it should at all. So be under no illusion, the comparison with the OLED is quite a cruel one, but this monitor still does pretty well in this scene really. And I've actually seen some monitors dark bias far too much in this scene, so they'll detect that there's a small amount of dark content and then they'll just pull everything down a lot. This monitor doesn't do that as much in this scene, so I've definitely seen massive masking of detail from some of the mini LED monitors I've used, some of the VA models. The Philips Evnia one I looked at recently was an example of that. That's the mini LED VA model by the way, not the QD OLED. That sort of just masked all of this detail, it was dark biasing like crazy. So the ACID certainly does better in that respect here. And like I said, just in general, it does a decent job in this scene. I'm on another scene, again on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. If you watched the SDR local dimming section of the video review then you probably know what I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk about the different local dimming settings. Remember I'm using average at the moment. Again this scene is more impressive on the QD OLEDs. It's actually quite a torture test for a mini LED backlight solution because there are some really small bright elements surrounded by dark to medium shades. So the precision really isn't there to do full justice to this scene. Around the embers there, for example, you'll be able to see halos, and if you move it can look like a kind of flickering effect. This isn't too bad with the average setting. You can also see it a bit around the blue lights in the background there, see so a kind of flickering. That's just because the dimming zones are transitioning very quickly between the brighter and darker state. The monitor could technically get around this with some other tuning of the algorithm specific to certain shade combinations like this but I'm not really sure how easy that is on a technical level for them to implement. It is quite typical to see this kind of behaviour with mini LED solutions, unless they're just very, very heavily dark biasing. Just to quickly mention the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7, because I included that in the graph, that did better in this particular scene. It does have twice as many dimming zones, it has a natively stronger contrast panel, and they tuned the algorithm a little bit more carefully for these mixtures of shades, where there are bright shades, and there aren't dark shades surrounding them, they're just medium shades, or medium to dark shades. It just didn't have the same kind of transitions going on. It seems like this why I don't like the fast setting. I can see straight away that the bright elements are brighter, so it's dark biasing less, and that flickering I was talking about becomes really pronounced. I'm not sure how this will look on the video, but it basically becomes much more eye-catching. I didn't find this bothersome in general with the average setting, but there were various scenes for HDR video content and for HDR game content, or if I'm just using SDR local dimming, where I felt that the fast setting was just a bit distracting. And yes, the average setting does have a bit of this flickering, as I mentioned, but I just don't find it as annoying. So what about that low setting then? It's hard to show this in the video. It doesn't flicker, but there's a little bit of trailing actually around the brighter objects and that's just because the zones aren't transitioning as quickly. I would recommend trying all of these settings by the way and picking the one you prefer, but my preference is average and I'm going to stick to that for the rest of this video except when I occasionally want to turn it off just to show you the comparison.
In fact, I'll do that now, I'll turn it off. So yeah, you can see that the atmosphere has been completely destroyed. I mean, this this scene is supposed to look a little bit foggy because it's got smoke from fireworks and it's just that kind of atmosphere they've tried to build up, but it's not supposed to look like this. Much better. I'm on Battlefield 5, I'm running HDR, and this is a scene I like for testing the brightness capabilities where there's a reasonable amount of bright shades, bright shades start to dominate. As you can see, it's still a mixture of shades, it's not just covered with bright shades everywhere, but there are some nice bright highlights and there is certainly a sufficient amount of bright shade here to make the ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter, kick in on OLED monitors and also a bit on the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7. On this monitor though, it does pretty nicely. The sun there is really nice and bright. Again, it's not super bright, there's a bit of dark biasing going on, but it's a little bit brighter than that glint I showed you on Tomb Raider actually, this is closer to 800 nits. So not quite at the peak of the monitor, which was closer to 1200 nits, but still nice and bright overall. It isn't as impressive as I saw on the PG32UQX. That was able to really push the brightness out extremely well here, so even if I was sitting in a brighter room, it was really eye-catching, and the glint of light on the ice here as well. On this it's quite subdued compared to what I saw on the ASUS. The sky though has a quite nice luminous quality overall and the clouds have a quite nice silver lining. So just in general not as much pop to these bright elements as I have seen, but certainly a livelier look to this scene than OLEDs provide, and also than the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 provided. And the monitor is still able to give nice depth for the darker elements, and it doesn't really dark bias too much here because there's a mixture of nice bright shade around these trees and, and the rocks. So it's a suitable mixture where the algorithm actually works quite well. Back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I showed you this under SDR. Now under HDR, the depth of some of these dark shades is more impressive actually, but again, it doesn't have the kind of inky depth that I see on OLEDs. However, it isn't just black. It might appear that way in the video, but there are actually some subtle details, some little bones, some little skulls, and the monitor's trying to display them. So again, some mini LED solutions dark bias really strongly here, so they almost shut the backlight off completely. The Acer isn't doing that here. It's certainly dragging things down, and actually again, there's dark biasing going on, so some of these subtle details aren't as visible as they could be. It certainly doesn't have the same look it does on an OLED again, I just have to stress that. But I think the compromise it's made in terms of the detail level and the depth here works pretty well, actually, given the number of dimming zones it has. However, the, the dark biasing does drag down some of the other shades, so more centrally, the wall at the back there, and the skulls here, when I'm zoomed out a bit at least, they just look duller than they should. They should have more pop to them. So it really is pretty heavy with its dark biasing, I have to say. But even so, you can see some haloing, so around where it said Tree of Life there, you could see that, around that campfire icon, and again around those HUD elements towards the bottom right, but the dark biasing does mean that these are dragged down a bit, so the haloing isn't as intense as it could be. That's basically the story of this monitor under HDR, to be honest. It dark biases strongly, and in some scenes, and for some elements in the scenes, I would say it probably dark biases too strongly. However, in doing so, it does maintain relatively good depth and atmosphere, and it avoids widespread and obvious haloing. Again, that's not to say there isn't any haloing, just that if it bright biased more, there would be more haloing. And I know some people find the haloing quite annoying on the ASUS PG32UQX and the ViewSonic XG321UG, for example. They have a more powerful and brighter backlight with twice as many dimming zones, but they bright bias a lot as well, so that does bring out the haloing. Some people, though, they do like the extra brightness, so it just sort of depends. It's really personal preference. I would have preferred that actually if they had a setting on this monitor where you could make it bright bias a bit more. I know I could go on at length about how they could retune the algorithm for some scenes and some elements, but it gets a little bit complicated, and I do understand the compromises they've made. But anyway, if I pause the game, this might give you a nice idea of the haloing. You can see that the, or hopefully you can see that the depth of the dark shade there is much better than close to where it says escape close. This is again with a bit of dark biasing, so the escape close and the white text in general isn't as bright as it could be, so the haloing is again not as extreme as it could be. 
And I'm just going to turn the local dimming solution off just for kicks. So yes, the entire backlight is at a high level now. It does not look pretty at all. I mean, the camera's exaggerating a little bit because of the exposure levels, but to my eye, it looks quite terrible as well. Ah, much better. One another scene on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I'm actually going to talk about color reproduction rather than contrast now. So under HDR, the monitor can put its very generous gamut to good use. Unlike under SDR, the developers don't have sRGB in mind. They have much wider color spaces such as DCI-P3 and even REC 2020, a huge gamut in mind. And just as a reminder to show you the DCI-P3 coverage capability of this monitor. Again, extension beyond DCI-P3, so there's encroachment onto REC 2020. I have to say though, the vibrancy level is good. However, it's not as strong as I would expect given how generous the gamut is. And if I compare to, for example, ASUS PG32UQX, the Acer does give a bit more of a subdued look to some of these green shades, for example. This actually is mainly the greens where I notice this. But I don't think the dark biasing is helping much. It is dulling some of these shades down a little bit. It should be a bit brighter. And actually the dark biasing is pretty heavy here, for example, and that subdues the oranges of these fruits or, or berries. They don't look bright and saturated. They do have good saturation, but they, again, they just look a bit dimmer than they should. But I look at Lara's skin, that looks nice and rich. It looks as it should really, although it does tend to look a bit better if the monitor isn't dark biasing so much. So it's a bit of a brighter scene. The flowers there stand out nicely as well. Actually very nice blue shades. The dark biasing doesn't seem to have much of an effect here and the color gamut does seem to be put to good use for these blue flowers. Very nice pop to them. So anyway, what I was trying to say with Lara's skin though is that if you remember under SDR I mentioned about all of this oversaturation. So the greens are more muted where they should be but there are still some nice lush and vibrant shades mixed in. So things are just toned down. The sky blues are toned down so it doesn't look so cartoonish. It looks more in place. Skin tones don't have the overdone, overly sun-kissed look that they had under SDR using the full native gamut. And that's again because the developers are actually targeting these colour spaces. The woody tones as well, these have too much of a red push under SDR, whereas they're toned down under HDR. The golds on Lara's dress are quite nice as well. They look quite nice and appropriate under HDR. So yeah, it's just some of these green shades mainly that I feel have a little bit less pop than I'd expect given the colour gamut. The multi-coloured stripes on this, by the way, with the light shining through it, they're quite nice. They look quite dull on the video, I can appreciate that, but to the eye they actually look brighter and quite nice. Good level of saturation. The oranges of these dresses are good as well. The oranges and reds look appropriate. So do these berries. But in this scene, again, the dark biasing does dull some of the shades a little bit, so the oranges of the dresses now look a little bit darker, a little bit duller than they should. I'm not saying they look washed out, by the way, just saying that the dark biasing is having an effect. And these lily pads look nice as well. They have light shining on them and the dark biasing isn't as strong. So I certainly do feel that the dark biasing is impacting some of these shades. These nice purple flowers don't look quite as vibrant as I've seen on some models either. And of course they aren't green shades. The yellow of the clothes or the towels in the background, nice as well a good level of pop to them without being completely overdone and too much of an orangey red shade as they appear under SDR. Well, not really a red shade, but just too orange. The fire looks nice as well. Some nice rich oranges and yellows without looking overdone. Vibrant, but not unnatural looking. I was desperately trying to find this fruit here. The greeny yellows, they do look quite nice, but again, not quite as impressive as I've seen on some monitors. Actually, the QD OLED shows these particularly nicely. So yeah, overall, I definitely feel that this monitor has a lot to offer under HDR. I do feel that the dark biasing is a bit on the strong side. Some people won't like that. I would have liked to see more flexibility or perhaps slightly different tuning of the algorithm. But I do understand why Acer's done what they have with the dimming zones they have on an IPS type panel. That's quite limited, that combination. The colour gamut could have perhaps been put to slightly better use, although again the dark biasing might be the main culprit why some shades look a little bit more subdued than they should. But overall a decent level of vibrancy, a good atmospheric look to darker shades, and some nice bright eye-catching elements as well.
I'm now on battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor has 160Hz refresh rate and I have the game running at a solid 160 frames a second. You can see my frame rate in the top right, that little tiny green number at the top there. And what this means is that the monitor is outputting over twice as much visual information every second as a 60Hz monitor or this monitor running at 60Hz. This gives you two main advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel that describes the precision and the fluidity when you're interacting with the game world. This is also something where low input lag is helpful and this monitor does indeed have low input lag, very low input lag, actually very impressive. I measured 2.2 milliseconds on this one, so really good, nice low signal delay, that's not an issue on this one. And if you happen to have adaptive dimming active, then that doesn't slow things down in that respect either. That didn't significantly affect the input lag readings, so really good to see that. The other advantage of this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it greatly decreases the perceived blur due to eye movement. This concept is explored in an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness and summarised in the written review. But basically, most of the perceived blur you see on a monitor is due to your own eye movement and it's tightly linked to the refresh rate of the monitor. In addition, you have to account for pixel responses. And as usual, I like to assess that using pursuit photographs with the test UFO motion test for ghosting and also subjectively, which is really what I do in this video. But let's just take a look at the pursuit photographs first of all. So here the monitor is running at 160 hertz. I would definitely recommend checking out the responsiveness section of the written review if you want more context and also additional examples at lower refresh rates and also some comparisons with a few other models, the Gigabyte M32U and the ASUS PG32UQX. They're just not included in this comparison because they don't run at 160 hertz, but there are comparisons with 144 hertz and lower refresh rates using those models. But basically this monitor is a good performer overall, it's a fast IPS model. Even if you have the overdrive set to off, it's by no means terrible in terms of its pixel responses. You just get a little bit of light powdery trailing, as I like to call it, behind the UFOs. But it's not an extreme weakness by any means. It's actually quite similar to the Gigabyte M32U using its optimal pixel overdrive setting. And that's a monitor which many people are very happy with indeed in terms of its pixel responses. And remember this is just using the off setting with the Acer. And if you compare with the ASUS PG32UQX, well that monitor certainly lags behind when it comes to pixel responses. And it has significantly more powdery trailing and some of it looks a little bit smeary in places for some transitions and that isn't an issue on this Acer, even if you're using the off overdrive setting. Moving on to normal, that removes some of the powdery trailing. There's just a little bit remaining. It really does stick close to the object though and it's mainly for the dark background, which is the top row, and a bit elsewhere for transitions not shown in this particular test, but nothing extreme by any means. There is some overshoot using this setting. You can see that inverse ghosting behind the UFOs. It's actually a bit clearer for some transitions which aren't shown in this test, and I'll try and show you them with the video very shortly, but I'd say it's moderate overshoot. Using the extreme setting on the other hand, that gives you colourful bright halo trailing with an inky look, which is much more noticeable to the eye. So in practice, either the off setting or the normal will be preferred depending on your tolerance to overshoot. I'm using normal at the moment and I do see some overshoot in places. So behind the edge of the wall there to the left of this wall, I can see some. I'm not sure if that'll come across on the video. It's not extreme overshoot by any means, like I said. Not super eye catching. There are some transitions which show it a bit more clearly, not in this particular scene. I might see if I can show you some a little bit later on. You can see it towards the left of the pillar there as well. But certainly at these high refresh rates, this isn't strong overshoot. And in terms of the weaknesses which remain, again, just a little bit of light powdery trailing in places. It's mainly where very bright shades are involved in the transition. And there are some bright shades involved in transitions here. You've got light sand. If I had the hood on, you'd be able to see some little white markers and that kind of thing. And that can give some of this powdery trailing, but it's not something you can assess with the video. It just adds a little bit of perceived blur because, you know, this isn't an OLED. You can see this kind of weakness if you look at the central area of the UFOs, the little white dots. They're blended together because of this as well. I'm on another scene on Battlefield 5. This one has a lot of darker shades involved in the transition, so it shows a greater variety of pixel transitions more clearly. And these are ones where IPS models do tend to struggle and VA models really tend to struggle with. And for that matter, TN models, although they're quite rare, they can have some standout weaknesses here as well, actually. But overall, the monitor does well. 
It's clearly a fast IPS model, good performance, minor weaknesses in terms of very slight powdery trailing, just adds a little bit of extra perceived blur on top of what you'd ideally see, but nothing too dramatic. Remember I'm using the normal settings still, so there is overshoot, and there's some clearer examples of that in this scene than the previous scene. You might be able to see this sort of blue fringe to the flag there. That's overshoot, a bit of bright halo trailing around the tree as well. There's also a bit of dirty trailing, which is darker than the background around the street lamp there. See if I can show it a bit more clearly with the sky in the background. You can see that kind of bit of a dark trailing around the light there. Not super eye-catching by any means. None of this is extreme overshoot. And again, some bright halo trailing around the makeshift roof there. If you do find this annoying, then just turn the overdrive off. That will shut off additional overdrive. It doesn't mean there's no overdrive going on. It seems that this panel is actually quite fast and it has some internal overdrive. So if you just want to use that without the additional overdrive, then use the offsetting. And again, the weaknesses aren't dramatic. There is more powdery trailing. It does add a bit of extra perceived blur, but it's not extreme. As I said, it's quite similar to the Gigabyte M32U, really, using its optimal setting. A little bit more of that, really, actually, than the Gigabyte. Some transitions are a little bit slower, but overall, not a dramatic difference. This is not sort of VA-level smearing, and there aren't the kind of weaknesses you see on the ASUS PG32UQX or the ViewSonic alternative, the XG321UG, either. So many people will be perfectly happy with the response performance with this set off, and if they happen to be annoyed by the overshoot, that's definitely worth checking out. Back to my preferred normal setting now, and I'd like to talk about VRR, variable refresh rate. This monitor supports HDMI 2.1 VRR, also supports adaptive sync, so you get the full array, you can use VRR with the PS5, the Xbox Series X, PC, with an AMD and NVIDIA GPU, whether you're using HDMI or DisplayPort. The claimed variable refresh rate range of this monitor is 48 to 160 hertz, although in practice, it seems to be more like 55 hertz to 160 hertz. This doesn't make a massive difference in practice. Just the thing to be aware of is that LFC, low frame rate compensation, is used, and when you pass that boundary in either direction, so let's say around 55 hertz, you go below that, or 55 frames a second in your game, you go below that, then it triggers LFC. And there's a subtle momentary stuttering when this activates or deactivates. Not everyone actually notices that. It's pretty subtle. It's not like the kind of stuttering you get from frame and refresh rate mismatches. And this is eliminated whether the monitor is using LFC or whether it's in its main variable refresh rate hardware operation range, so above 55 hertz, it does get rid of tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches very nicely. And there aren't any particular issues which I note with some models like VRR flickering. You don't typically see that outside of OLED or VA models, so still, you know, it's, it's nice to, to note that that isn't an issue. You can also use HDR at the same time as VRR if you wish. It's not a problem. And that's on both the AMD and the NVIDIA side. I've now got the game running at 120 frames a second. The monitor is running at 120 hertz. This does intensify the overshoot. It's not like it suddenly appears in an intense way when you hit 120 hertz. It's just that it does get stronger and stronger as you go below 160 hertz. So it is more eye-catching now. You might be able to see it on the video. I don't know how it'll appear on the video, to be honest, but I can see some pretty bright halo trailing. In this scene in particular, it's actually quite bad for the overshoot. Most scenes are a bit better than this, so the overshoot's a bit less noticeable. But again, you can of course use that offsetting if it bothers you. I'm just going to switch over to that now. So yes, a bit more powdery trailing in places, but the pixel response requirements for a solid performance here are actually decreased compared to 160 hertz. So these weaknesses are actually less apparent when you compare the two models, not that they're extreme. Anyway, just worth noting really that at 120 hertz, the offsetting is actually pretty good. And I'm pleased to see that you can actually adjust the overdrive now. This was added with one of the firmware updates. You weren't originally able to do that. For some reason, they locked out the overdrive setting if you have FreeSync Premium Pro enabled in the monitor, which enables adaptive sync. So you could get around that by using HDMI 2.1 VRR, which doesn't require adaptive sync. But if you've got an AMD GPU, that isn't an option. And if you're using DisplayPort as an NVIDIA user, it's not an option. So that was really nice to see them add this support because I do think the offsetting is going to be something which people might like to use, particularly if you're sensitive to overshoot and you're frequently dipping well below the maximum refresh rate supported by the monitor.
Speaking of which, I am now running the game at 80 frames a second, 80 hertz. I'm using the off setting still. Actually works really nicely here. No particular overshoot to speak of. The powdery trailing is really minimal, to be honest. It's uh, just a little bit. Pixel response requirements slackened off further with this reduction in refresh rate. So it does really very well with the off setting even. The normal setting then, that gives really quite strong overshoot by this point. Some bright eye-catching flashes, even if you're not really looking out for it, it just I find it catches the eye when you're just playing a game normally even. Some people might not find that. It's not the strongest overshoot I've seen and it's not as strong as if I switch over to the extreme setting. I'll just do that briefly just for fun. So yeah, it's not like this. This is absolutely horrific and extremely distracting. So yeah, the normal setting is nothing quite like this. I'm now at 60 frames a second and I'm using the normal setting. 60 hertz, 60 frames a second. And yeah, the overshoot is really quite strong, quite obnoxious now using the normal setting. Set to off, much nicer experience. No perceived overshoot, and it still does well in terms of its pixel responses. So again, I would just stress that for some people, the offsetting is going to be really the one to use. I would recommend trying out normal, seeing if you find the overshoot bothersome, particularly if you're able to sustain good high frame rates. And I know it's not nice to have to switch to different response time settings depending on the game or depending on the scene of the game all the time. Try both settings and see which you prefer. This one doesn't include a BFI black frame insertion or strobe backlight setting. That isn't an option on this one. So you just got this normal sample and hold experience here. But really this is quite a strong IPS performer in terms of its pixel responses and indeed its input lag. So when it comes to responsiveness, I'd really say it's the best monitor I've tested with an FALD backlight solution actually. And the backlight solution itself, if you're using adaptive dimming, is also very reactive. Generally I would tend to use that kind of thing, not for competitive gaming, but for more casual gaming or just slightly competitive gaming. Some people might still like to use it. I do feel this monitor is quite diverse with a sort of range of gamers which it can satisfy. To wrap up then, the monitor has a nice solid feel to it in my opinion. The metal stand helps with that, the coated metal stand. And the screen is quite firmly attached as well. It doesn't wobble a lot when you knock it or anything like that. Good ergonomic flexibility. It doesn't offer you portrait adjustment, but it does have good height adjustment, tilt and swivel left and right. It has a nice selection of ports, including HDMI 2.1, which is good for console compatibility in particular, and also USB-C with a generous 90 watts of power delivery. The screen size and resolution combination, it's one I like in terms of being able to deliver a nice immersive experience. You can move a little bit further back if you wish as well. It does facilitate that kind of thing. But just from a normal desktop viewing position, I find that it is a nice pixel density, very workable for me without any scaling, very usable, very comfortable to use, and a good level of clarity and detail on the desktop and also outside of the desktop for suitably high resolution image content, and games and that kind of thing gives a distinctly sharper, crisper look than you get with, for example, 27-inch QHD monitors. In terms of the contrast experience, largely in line with what I'd expect from an IPS panel, except with a bit lower IPS glow. It's not as intense. It's quite colourful in places, but it just isn't as bright, and I don't find it as eye-catching. I guess it could be a bit subjective, but it is what I consider a low glow panel, which is nice to see. The screen surface was quite agreeable as well for me. It was a light to very light matte anti-glare screen surface. A little bit of a grainy look. I would have preferred it to be a bit smoother ideally, but this is something I'm very sensitive to. For most people, this is going to be absolutely fine. The adaptive dimming setting with the 576 zone local dimming of the backlight is nice as well. Not so much on the desktop, but certainly for games and movies and particularly non-competitive gaming, I find. It's quite a nice thing to have. It enhances the experience, definitely enhances the contrast. The way that it's set up, it does tend to dark bias a lot, so it does drag some medium shades down, for example, so they're dimmer than they should be. And I know some people won't necessarily like this. It would have been nice to have some flexibility to change that a bit. Under SDR, you can just increase the brightness, which will make this less noticeable, this dark biasing, but it will also mean that when you have lots of bright shades on the screen or bright to medium shades, they're just overdone, overblown, really bright. Under HDR, on the other hand, you have much greater tone mapping precision and you tend to have bright highlights. 
a greater variety of medium shades with appropriate depth, that kind of thing, or, or ideally you would. But again, the dark bising is pretty strong, so it does tend to drag lots of those medium shades down so they're darker than they should be. Even so, it gives you nice bright highlights, not bright as I've seen, not as bright as on the ASUS PG32 UQX, for example, but certainly what I would consider bright. Even if your room is pretty well lit, it can give you some nice pop to bright highlights and that kind of thing. It's also able to produce a nice atmospheric look to darker shades. No perpixel illumination or anything OLED-like going on here. And the dimming zone count is quite limited in that respect. Although, again, with the dark biasing, it does tend to favour actually the sort of atmospheric look a bit more. It does mean that some shades would ideally be a bit brighter than they're shown. So I would have liked to have seen a setting which eases up on the dark biasing even though I do understand what they've done with the relatively limited number of dimming zones they've got and the IPS type panel. And really the HDR experience is a real cut above what most LCDs provide. I know that's not really saying much, but it is worth mentioning that the HDR experience on this one is certainly one of the better monitors if you just consider the overall monitor market. Color reproduction, uh, well, that's an important part of HDR, and in that respect, the monitor does pretty well. It has a very generous gamut. The gamut wasn't put to full use. Um, it, it seems that it did cut back a little bit compared to what it could, particularly for certain green shades. And I don't think the dark biasing really helped in that respect. It did make some shades look a little bit more subdued than they can, but I'm not saying it looks washed out. Very far from that, it's uh, still a vibrant experience and certainly a more vibrant HDR experience than most LCDs will provide. And under SDR, where the full native gamut is used to full effect if you want it to be, very high vibrancy levels, and also very good support for Adobe RGB and DCI-P3, as well as sRGB, so really flexible if you want to use the monitor for colour critical work, or simply work where colour accuracy in a wide gamut is desirable. The sRGB emulation setting on the monitor works pretty well as well, it's a decent sRGB emulation setting. Not super flexible, but you can at least adjust the brightness, which is nice to see. Would have been nice to be able to adjust the colour channels as well, but you know, you can't always have everything. The monitor's responsiveness was very good overall. Good 160Hz experience with rapid pixel responses and very low input lag. The weaknesses were minor as far as IPS models go, really. That is to say the weaknesses in terms of slower than optimal pixel responses and powdery trailings, I like to call it, just a little bit of that in places. Nothing that most people are really going to actively notice, to be honest, and that would be the case even if you happen to be using the offsetting. There's not an extreme amount of this powdery trailing even then, and the offsetting completely gets rid of overshoot, because with the normal setting there is some overshoot, and that does become stronger as the refresh rate decreases, and that's particularly important if you're using VRR, Variable Refresh Rate Technology, which this monitor supports, AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync or HDMI 2.1 VRR. Works in much the same way with all of these, it does work well. And there are no particular issues of note with VRR flickering or anything like that. But really just the overshoot you have to be aware of. But if it does bother you, you can just set the overdrive to off, which is something they added with a recent firmware update to the monitor. So I'm really pleased to see that they added that because that's a really nice flexibility to have. So overall, this is really quite a unique monitor on the market. Actually, it's a completely unique monitor because of the size, the resolution, and the dimming zone count. There isn't anything else in this exact category on the market. And I do feel it offers a nice experience overall. It has a lot going for it. Not perfect, you know, I would say that perhaps a setting with more bright biasing for the HDR and the local dimming would have been nice to see. And perhaps if I'm being picky, I would have liked to have seen a pixel overdrive setting somewhere between off and normal. But still a nice experience in many respects. And some monitors you could compare this to, one that sticks in my mind is the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7, because that is the same size, the same resolution, and it has an FALD full array local dimming mini LED backlight solution like this one. But the Samsung has twice as many dimming zones. It also uses a VA panel, so it has a native contrast advantage. So it doesn't have to dark bias as much as this monitor, as this Acer does. And I also noticed a little bit of flickering under HDR on the Acer with certain shade combinations. Generally, if the dimming zones were rapidly changing with a medium background and a small brighter object, so for example a street lamp with a foggy sky in the background, just to give an example, the rapid changes in the local dimming solution could give a bit of a flickering effect. If you use the low setting for adaptive dimming, it does get rid of that. I did demonstrate and talk about this earlier in the review. Samsung doesn't really have that issue, but it does have other issues. 
the ace is able to sustain its brightness really well where bright shades dominate and actually it's less likely to be dark biasing there so it actually lets it unlock more of its brightness the samsung on the other hand it has some sort of power limitation which means that it will cut back on brightness where bright shades dominate so it doesn't do as well in scenes like that the samsung also has some issues with interlaced pattern artifacts which I explore more in the written reviews. It's not really something I mention too much in the video reviews because it's not something which everyone's really sensitive to or cares about. It's one of those sort of technical details that I like to explore more in the written content. But the Samsung definitely had more issues in that respect. With static interlaced pattern artifacts, sort of a interlaced lines even where there's no movement on the screen. And the Acer also has a more generous color gamut and more consistent colors because of its IPS type panel. So overall it does give richer color output as well as being potentially more accurate. And yeah, the curve of the Samsung screen really isn't going to be to everyone's taste. Some people will like it. I kind of like it for some things, but not other things. So overall, I just prefer the flat screen of this Acer. And at the higher end, if you consider more expensive models, you have ones like the Asus PG32 UQX and the ViewSonic XG321 UG, the ViewSonic alternative to that one. They're significantly more expensive than the Acer. They're also significantly slower if you're sensitive to pixel response time weaknesses, then the Acer is a better bet. But with twice as many dimming zones and being less shy about bright biasing more, those monitors do provide really a more dynamic and bright HDR experience with more of a wow factor, really. So they are worth checking out if that kind of thing really appeals to you and you have the budget. So I haven't really mentioned the price. I mean, it's something which changes, but at the moment, the Acer retails for around 1,200 US dollars. It seems to be a bit more in other markets but it's still cheaper than the ViewSonic and Asus models I just mentioned. And it is a completely unique option in the market and it's one which some people are really going to enjoy. So that's really all there is to the Acer Predator X32 FP. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, a nice way of showing your support.